Well, good morning, everyone. I have a, a special message for you this morning. <laughs> it's about the holidays. <clears throat> you know, we, as Sherry mentioned, we cannot meet today in person as we usually do every Shabbat at the community center uh, because the community center is closed because of the holidays. So I thought uh, I should prepare a teaching on the holidays. But you know, before I begin, I have to, um, I have to warn you that uh, this message can and will upset some of you. First, let me start by asking you a question. What do you consider to be a good message? Uh, is a good message one that makes you feel good about yourself? You know, some mega churches have over 20,000 people and uh, they avoid talking about God's law, about sin, about hell. They mostly have feel good messages that inspire that encourage and that make people feel good or that talk about prosperity theory that, uh, you know, you're, God's gonna make you rich. You know, Paul warned about this in 2 Timothy chapter four, verse three and four. He says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. And they're going to turn away from the truth. And what, what is truth? Well, God's word tells us that your Torah is truth. God's Torah is truth. And so people are turning away from the Torah to hear what their itching ears want to hear. You know, the truth is important, but the truth sometimes can hurt. It can shock people. But if you accept the truth and make changes to your life, then you will know the truth and the truth as John says, can set you free. So listen, a good message is not one that makes you laugh or one that makes you cry. A good message is one that makes you change. Now let's talk about the holidays. Well, Wikipedia has definition of holidays as a day set aside by custom or by law on which normal activities, especially business or work, are suspended or reduced. Generally, holidays are intended to allow individuals to celebrate or commemorate an event or tradition of cultural or religious significance. They also say the concept of holidays originated in connection with religious observances. The intention of a holiday was typically to allow individuals to tend to religious duties associated with holy days on the calendar. So it makes sense, right? You see the word holiday comes from holy day. We get holidays to celebrate holy days. And they're meant to be a day where we do no work in order to keep a religious feast. Understand? But who should decide which day is holy? Should we let God decide or should we let man decide? 
Now, this is very important. You know, what should we as believers use as reference? Should we use God's word or should we use man's wisdom? Now, your answer can determine whether you are a child of God or not. <laughs> you know, so many people that call themselves Christians look at man's wisdom and laws rather than looking at God's instruction manual to determine what is right or not. For example, you know, in Canada, homosexuality and abortion, it's legal according to Canadian law, but according to God's law, it's a sin. What man calls food, pork and seafood is definitely not food in God's eyes, according to Leviticus 11. So do we let man decide which days are holidays, or should we let God decide which days are holy days, right? Well, if we look at God's instruction manual, you'll find that in Leviticus 23 is where God lists all of his holy days. It starts off by saying, the Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, the Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these. And he goes on to list the weekly Sabbath and seven annual holy days, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacle. And these are the times we are convocated to meet with him. It's a special time that he wants to meet with us, to draw closer to us, a time of blessing. And at House of Adonai, we teach and we celebrate all of these feasts. But the message today will not be on any of these. They're going to be on days that some people celebrate as holidays that are not on this list. It's important to note that in Leviticus 23, these are the only days that God has called holy. Now, what about Christmas and Easter? Are these not the most holy days of the Christian calendar? Surely the Bible instructs us to keep these, right? Well, the answer, it may surprise some of you, but no. You will not find any mention of the word Christmas or Easter anywhere in the Bible. Now, one exception, because some people are going to say, oh, no, I found the word Easter in the Bible. I have to explain that in the New Testament, in Hebrew, it's called the Brit Hadashah, um, the word Pesach appears 73 times. And um, in all the Bibles, except King James, the word Pesach is translated 73 times to Passover, because that's what Passover is. It's Pesach, right? But in the King James Version, they translated Pesach to Passover 72 times. And just one time, it's an error, Acts 12, verse 4, they use the word Easter. They translate Pesach to Easter, go figure. But it's not Easter, it's Passover, it's Pesach. So just a technicality I want to clarify, because when I say yeah, there's no mention anywhere in the Bible, there's always someone that will email me and say, oh, I found mention of Easter. So I want to 
make sure people understand that that is a mistake, a translation error. It should read Passover there, in Acts 12, 4, of only the King James Version. So the point I want to make here is the Bible does not speak anywhere about Christmas or Easter. So if we can't use the Bible to learn about Christmas, then let's use man's reference books, like the encyclopedia, to see what they have to say about Christmas. So we find here in Encyclopedia Americana, it says, Christmas was not observed in the first centuries of the Christian church, since the Christian usage in general was to celebrate the death and remarkable persons of remarkable persons rather than their birth. A feast was established in memory of this event, Christ's birth in the fourth century. In the fifth century, the Western church ordered the feast to be celebrated on the day of the Mithraic rites of the birth of the sun and at the close of the Saturnalia as no certain knowledge of the day of Christ's birth existed. Now, what I want to mention about this, we see here that people did not start to celebrate Christmas until 300 years after Yeshua died. So his disciples and Paul did not celebrate Christmas. No wonder there is no mention of it in the Bible. They're the ones that wrote it, that wrote the New Testament. Also note that no certain date of Christ's birth they're talking about. That's because, as we learned last week uh, in uh, Sophie's excellent teaching, Yeshua, he was born on the Feast of Tabernacle. And it is not a fixed date on the Gregorian calendar. One year it might fall in September, the next year it might fall in October. And that's why it says uh, no certain knowledge of the day of Christ's birth existed. They couldn't pin it down to it was October 4th. So they um, picked the date of December 25th. It happens to be uh, the day of the Mithraic rites of the birth of the sun. Okay, so let's move on and look at what uh, Britannica had to say about Christianity. It says Christianity by a complex and gradual process became the official religion of the Roman Empire. For a time, coins and other monuments continued to link Christian doctrines with the worship of the sun to which Constantine had been addicted previously. But even when this phase came to an end, Roman paganism continued to exert other permanent influences, great and small. The ecclesiastical calendar retains numerous remnants of pre-Christian festivals, notably Christmas, which blends elements including both the Feast of Saturnalia and the birthday of Mithra. A few things here to note. Roman paganism, more specifically, the worship of the sun, influenced Christianity. And Constantine, the first pope of the Catholic Church, who used to be addicted to the sun, sun worshiping, played a big role in that. Also note that it says that Christmas is linked to the birthday of Mithra. And who is Mithra? Britannica says in the Roman world, Saturnalia, which is December 17th, was a time of merrymaking and exchanging of gifts. And December 25, 25th, was also regarded as the birthday of the Iranian sun god, 
Mithra, the son of righteousness, son with a U. On the Roman New Year, January 1st, houses were decorated with greenery and lights, and gifts were given to children and the poor. To these observances were added the German and Celtic uh, Yule rites when the Teutonic tribes penetrated into Gaul, Britain, and Central Europe. Food and good fellowship, the Yule log and Yule cakes, greenery and fir trees like Christmas trees, gifts and greetings all commemorated different aspects of this festival. So we see here that Mithra is the sun god. And his birthday is when? On December 25th. And you thought that Christmas was the celebration of Christ's birth? As we learned last week, as I mentioned from Sophie's teaching, Christ was not born in December, but in the fall during the Feast of Tabernacle. So if Christ was not born on December 25th, then why do we celebrate Christmas on this date? If you ask any pastor or Bible scholar, they will tell you that they know that Christ was not really born on December 25th. But no one really knows the exact date he was born. So a date was chosen and agreed upon. Really? And it happened to be on the date of the sun god's birthday? Another encyclopedia quote. How much the date of the festival depended upon the pagan Brumalia, December 25th, following Saturnalia, December 17th to 24th, and celebrating the shortest day of the year and the new sun cannot accurately be determined. The pagan Saturnalia and Brumalia were too deeply entrenched in popular custom to be set aside by Christian influence. The pagan festival with its riot and merrymaking were so popular that Christians were glad of an excuse to continue its celebration with little change in spirit and in manner. Christian preachers of the West and the Near East it protested against the unseemingly frivolity with which Christ's birthday was celebrated, while Christians of Mesopotamia accused their Western brethren of idolatry and of sun worship for adopting as Christian this pagan festival. You see, Christmas you are is a pagan festival. It's linked to sun god worshiping. And it was brought into the church by whom? By Constantine, that used to be a sun worshiper. And many believers in that time were upset by this, calling it idolatry and sun worshiping. And that's what it was, and that's what it is. And did you know that Christmas used to be outlawed in the US? In the 17th century, the Puritans of New England, they understood how wrong Christmas was. Read here from Wikipedia. Christmas observance was outlawed in Boston in 1659. It was not until the mid 19th century that celebrating Christmas became fashionable in the Boston region. You know, the same Puritans that I spoke to you about when we spoke about the Feast of Tabernacles, they brought the Feast of Tabernacles to America and it's become known as Thanksgiving today. These same Puritans, they actually banned Christmas observance by law in 1659. They would be giving out fines and even imprisonment for if anyone was found celebrating Christmas. And it was almost 200 years before this law about Christmas changed there. 
The Puritans, they knew its roots and they labeled it as heathen idolatry and sun worship. Now, there's hundreds of articles and reference materials out there proving that Christmas has its origins in pagan sun god worship. But please, don't just take my word for it. Do your own research. And as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things and hold on to only what is good. This mess is not one of those things you should hold on to. Some say that we need to put Christ back into Christmas. This is heard every year from thousands of pulpits and, and in churches. But you know, the true Christ was never there. Just as a person cannot go back into a room that he had never been into, Christ cannot be put back into an event that he had never been in. Now, Santa is in Christmas. Christmas trees, gifts, turkey, they're in all in Christmas, but not Christ. The real Christ, Yeshua, was never in and never will be in Christmas, nor can he be put back into where he never was. But the God of this world, Satan, has always been in Christmas. In fact, he's the author of it. And Miguel, I'm sorry, I don't think you have this for Spanish translation. I just added it this morning. But 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So based on all this information that we just looked at, is Christmas a holy day? I don't think so. But what about Easter? The celebration of Yeshua's death and resurrection. Well, Yeshua actually he didn't die on Passover. He died, uh, he didn't die on Easter, excuse me. He died on Passover. The Last Supper was a Passover setter, as we see here in Luke 22. It says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this, eat this what? Passover with you before I suffer. He was captured that night, put on trial on the morning of Passover, and died that day at 3 p.m. Why add another feast, Easter, sometimes two weeks apart from Passover, to commemorate his death and resurrection? You know, God's word is perfect. There's nothing to add to God's perfect word. Besides, there's something wrong regarding Easter. It just doesn't add up. In Matthew 12, 38 to 40, let's read together. It says, then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Yeshua predicted that day, he prophesied that he would spend three days and three nights in the tomb. Very clearly, 
right? That's the only sign he would give them. So help me out here. He died at 3 p.m., right? On Good Friday. How could he have resurrected early in the morning on Sunday? And that is three days and three nights. That's a day and a half. It just, right? Right there, that should be enough for people to shake their head and say, how does this make any sense? Why are we celebrating this? They can't even count the three of these people. <laughs> right? So just uh, something I wanted to share with you. This should be enough right there to say, well, there's something wrong with Easter. Besides the fact that it doesn't show up anywhere in the Bible, there's got to be something wrong. So again, just because Easter cannot be found in God's reference book, let's look at man's reference book to find out more about Easter. Well, from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, we find the term Easter was derived from the Anglo-Saxon Easter, the name of the goddess of spring and fertility. In her honor, sacrifices were offered at the time of the vernal equinox. By the fourth century, the term came to be applied to the anniversary of Christ's resurrection. And have you ever wondered where Easter eggs and bunnies come from? Was it because when he died on the cross, there were bunnies running around and they found some Easter eggs at the, at the foot of the cross or at the tomb when he resurrected? No, <laughs> nothing to do with it. Again, Easter is not in the Bible. The New Standard Encyclopedia says the exchange of Easter eggs which symbolize new life and fertility is one of the oldest traditions. Rabbits and flowers are also pagan fertility symbols. The hare, which is a rabbit, the symbol of fertility in ancient Egypt, a symbol that was kept later in Europe, is not found in North America. Its place is taken by the Easter rabbit, the symbol of fertility. Now, ever wonder why there are Easter eggs and bunnies to celebrate Yeshua's death and resurrection? And why does the church celebrate Easter as a holy feast? Well, would it surprise you that a certain Constantine, the first pope of the Catholic Church, was behind this, the same person that was addicted to sun worship and was behind the introduction of Christmas, he was the main person responsible for Easter. Read about it here. In, in uh, 325 AD, Constantine, the first Pope and the Council of Nyssa, decreed that Christians should no longer keep Jewish feasts, such as Passover, but instead keep Easter, because God had shown them a better way. And you can find this for yourself on the internet. I don't know if you can see the top of the screen. If you're interested, I can send you a copy of it. I've got the www address on the internet. But uh, this is a letter that Constantine wrote to those in the church that were not present at the meeting of the Council of Nyssa, encouraging them to not keep Passover, but to keep Easter instead. It reads, when the question relative to the sacred festival of Easter arose, it was universally thought that it would be convenient that all should keep the feast on one day. For what could be more beautiful and more desirable than to see this festival through which we receive the hope of immortality celebrated 
by all with one accord in the same manner. It was declared to be particularly unworthy for this, the holiest of all festivals, to follow the custom of the Jews, who had soiled their hands with the most fearful of crimes, and whose minds were blinded in rejecting, <coughs> rejecting this custom, we may transmit to our descendants the legitimate mode of celebrating Easter, which we have observed from the time of the Savior's passion to the present day. We ought not, therefore, to have anything in common with the Jews, for the Savior has shown us another way. Our worship follows a more legitimate and more convenient course is the order of the days of the week. <clears throat> and consequently, and you unanimously adopting this mode, we desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews. For it is truly shameful for us to hear them boast that without their direction, we could not keep this feast of Passover. How can they be in the right? They who after the death of the Savior have no longer been led by reason but by wild violence, and their delusion may urge them. They do not possess the truth in the Easter question, for in their blindness and repugnance in all, to all improvements, they frequently celebrate two Passovers in the same year. We could not imitate those who are openly in error. How then could we follow these Jews who are most certainly blinded by error. For to celebrate the Passover twice in one year is totally inadmissible. But even if this were not so, it would still be your duty not to tarnish your soul by communications with such wicked people, the Jews. Besides, consider well that in such an important matter and on a subject of such great solemnity, there ought not to be any division. Our Savior has left us only one festival day of our redemption, that is to say, of his holy passion, and he desired to establish only one Catholic church. Think then how unseemingly it is that on the same day some people be fasting while others are seated at a banquet, and that after Easter, some should be rejoicing at feasts while others are still observing a strict fast. For this reason, a divine providence wills that this custom should be rectified and regulated in a uniform way, and everyone, I hope, will agree upon this point. As on the one hand, it is our duty not to have anything in common with the murderers of our Lord. And so it has been decided that the most holy festival of Easter should be everywhere celebrated on one and the same day. And it is not seemingly that in so holy a thing there should be any division as this is the state of the case, except joyfully the divine favor and this truly divine command. Wow. Constantine. He says a few things here. He says many things, but I just want you to point out four things. He says that Christians should no longer follow the custom of the Jews. In other words, Passover. Is Passover a Jewish custom or is Passover in the Bible? I don't think Constantine wrote or read the Bible. And then he says that they should follow a more convenient course, the days of the week. In other words, the Gregorian calendar versus God's calendar. As I explained, because Passover is never on the same date, you know, 
Some years it's in September, some years it's in October. They, they don't like that. They say it should be always in October. It should always be the second Monday of the month or, or whatever, you know? Um, because they, they, they do that, uh, they want to make that change and everyone celebrate on one fixed date on the Gregorian calendar. And they also say that the Jews do not possess the truth about the date to celebrate the feasts. They even celebrate sometimes twice in a year Passover. And I think that's completely ridiculous. Again, I'm sure Constantine never read the Torah, Numbers chapter nine. God actually instructed that we can keep, we can have a second Passover exactly one month after the first one. If for some reason we weren't able to celebrate the first one because we were traveling or we were unclean because we touched a dead body, he provided a clause in Numbers chapter nine and then these people could have Passover one month later. Obviously, Constantine knew nothing about it. He never read Numbers nine and he thought this was completely ridiculous and didn't want anything to do with that custom of the Jews. But you can see here, it's full of anti-Semitism. Constantine, the first Pope of the Catholic Church, he hated the Jews. He wanted nothing to do with them. He was encouraging everyone to associate with them and have nothing to do with the Jews. And sadly, this still is prevalent in churches today. People think, oh, the Jews, and they've got that, and it's been passed down because of this mentality. Very sad. So, if God tells us that we are not to practice pagan sun god worship, and that he hates that, and that we are not to add to what he has asked us to do, should we keep Christmas and Easter? Look at Deuteronomy 12. He said, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their God saying, how did these nations serve their God? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their God. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. And you shall not add to it, nor take away from it. It's very clear. So now, could our God that hates for us to worship as the pagans do, change his mind and now be okay with us celebrating what he used to hate? I don't think so. Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I do not change. God never changes. So what he hated, he still hates. He still hates Christmas. And what he loves, he still loves, he still loves Passover and God's utter feast. God does not change. Now, this is very important. You listen to this. I know that some what some of you are thinking. You are not into sun god worshiping or into the fertility goddess worship. For you, it's all about God and celebrating his birth, his death, and his re resurrection. And God, he knows your heart, right? Well, really, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You know, it may not be a Christmas and Easter. It may not be what it means to you, but you know what? 
It really does not matter what it means to you. What matters is what it means to him. By celebrating these feasts, you are being unfaithful to God. You think God does not care about you celebrating on the feast of the sun god or on the feast of the goddess of fertility? Well, it doesn't bother you, so why should it bother him, right? Now, suppose you were to tell your spouse, okay, you're married. And um, say you were married on October 4th. And you know that you're, you're to celebrate your anniversary that's coming up. You know that your, your spouse would love uh, to uh, go out to a restaurant, nice restaurant, have a nice supper, uh, come back and, and listen to music and sit in front of the fire. You know, that's what she would love on her anniversary, right? But you tell your spouse, uh, uh, my sweetheart, uh, we're going to change things. Instead of celebrating um, on October 4th, our anniversary, why don't we do it in May? Okay, let's do it on May 9th, which happens to be the anniversary of uh, your, your wedding to your first wife, okay? And instead of going to the restaurant and then sitting in front of the fire and listening to music, you're going to uh, go fishing because <clears throat> that's what your ex-wife used to love doing. You're gonna go fishing and uh, you're going to uh, uh, go for uh, a climb up the mountain. Because again, that's what your ex-wife used to. So you're going to change all that, and but but you're doing it for your new wife. And come on, the new wife should should understand that you're doing it for her. Really, come on. You think your wife would understand? Well, that's exactly how God feels. He wasn't born on December 25th, and he didn't die at Easter. He was born during the Feast of Tabernacle, and he died at Passover. And he asked us to commemorate and remember and celebrate those feasts and not to celebrate the other ones because you know what? He's a jealous God. Look at this, Exodus 25. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. And again, for the Lord, your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. He does not like this. You think he's okay with you doing this? He's seeing it as cheating on him, as being disloyal to him. And even though you think you're doing it for him, and, and that's not what it means to you. It's not about sun god worshiping. You didn't even know about that or, or goddess of fertility. You didn't know about those until today. Still, it doesn't matter what it means to you. What really counts is what it means to him. Oh, we talked about Christmas. Oh, and we talked about Easter. Now, what about Hanukkah and Purim? Surely, we ought to celebrate these, right? They are in the Bible. Well, again, according to God's word, these in Leviticus 23 are the only feasts that God calls holy and asks us to celebrate every year. Hanukkah and Purim are not on this list. Read again, Leviticus 23, if you don't believe me. Just what is Hanukkah? Well, for those that don't know, in the second century BC, the Holy Land was ruled by uh, Syrian Greeks 
who tried to force the people of Israel to accept Greek culture and beliefs instead of God's word. And against all odds, a small band of faithful Jews led by Judah the Maccabee defeated one of the mightiest armies on earth and drove the Greeks from the land. And they reclaimed the holy temple and they rededicated it to the service of God. Now, when they came to light the menorah in the temple, they found only a single cruise of oil, of olive oil, that had escaped contamination from the Greeks. And miraculously, they lit the menorah and the one day supply of oil lasted eight days until new oil could be prepared under conditions of ritual purity. Now, to commemorate and publicize these miracles, the sages instituted the festival of Hanukkah. And if you look in your Bible, most Bibles don't have the book of the Maccabees, but some Bibles you can find that in. And in 2 Maccabee is where you will find this. It says they celebrated it for eight days with rejoicing in the manner of the festival of booths, remembering how lo not long before, during the festival of booths, they had been wandering in the mountains and caves like wild animals. Therefore, carrying ivy wreathed wands and beautiful branches and also fronds of palm, they offered hymns of thanksgiving to him who had given success to the purifying of their own holy place. And they, the Jews, decreed by public edict, they ratified by vote that the whole nation of the Jews should observe these days every year. So you see, this is a man-made feast, not one of God's holy days. They had a vote and they chose this is what we're going to do every year to remember this. It's not God that says, and you shall celebrate this every year and not forget, like he does for the other feasts in Leviticus 23. This is something they chose to do and commemorate every year. And so on every night of Hanukkah, they uh, light a flame, okay? One on the first day, two on the second day, until the eight flames are burning on the eighth night. And there is an additional candle known as the shamash or the helper, okay, the middle one, from which the flames are lit. And the specifically crafted implement, uh, the, uh, the chandelier, is called a hanukia, okay? You can see one here on the screen. Now, some say that it's okay to celebrate Hanukkah because you know, even Yeshua himself, he celebrated Hanukkah. And they use this one verse in the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament in John 10, verse 22, 23, it says, and the time came for the Feast of Dedication, also called Hanukkah, or the Feast of Lights, recalling the rededication of the temple in 164 BC at Jerusalem. And it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's porch. And there you have it. It said that Jesus was celebrating Hanukkah. Really? Does that mean... To celebrate Hanukkah, you got to go at the temple and walk in Solomon's porch. That's what Hanukkah is? No. As we just explained, Hanukkah is about lighting candles, right? Does it say he was lighting the candles of the Hanukkah? No. He was walking at the temple. It's got nothing to do with Hanukkah. Besides, Yeshua went to the temple almost every day. It's as if you said, oh, on that day, Jean went to Walmart. So it proves that Jean celebrates Hanukkah because he walked to, at Walmart on the day of the feast of Hanukkah. 
got nothing to do with it. Yet people are just trying to grasp something and say, look, in the same verse, it talks about Yeshua and Hanukkah. So that means he celebrated it. He did not celebrate Hanukkah. It is not one of God's holy feast days. It's a man-made Jewish feast. Okay. And furthermore, who gave man the right to modify God's holy menorah? Right? In Exodus 25, 31 to 33, and we've covered this in Miguel's excellent teaching on the tabernacle, but the menorah, God instructed you are to make a menorah of pure gold by hammered work. He specifically said how to make it with flowers and cups and bulbs. And there are to be how many branches? Six, not nine. I mean, six on each side and the seventh one in the center. So there should be seven altogether, not nine. And yet they take the, this and they add two more branches and they call it a Hanukkiah and they use it in the celebration of God. This is a holy item that God described and is meant to worship him. Not modifying. It's a terrible thing to modify. God's design uh, was perfect. It's, it's like profane fire, if you will. Hanukkah is not a holy day. Now, while Hanukkah, it, it's not a pagan feast like Christmas and Easter, it still is not found in Leviticus 23. And God never asked us to keep it. But we are not to celebrate it in the church or treat it as a holy day. It would be like celebrating Canada Day in the church. Now, you can definitely remember the great miracle that God did on, uh, during that time. There's nothing wrong with that. You want to do it at your own home, right? But don't add to God's word an extra holy day that would be like telling him that, you know what? His word is imperfect and incomplete. He made a mistake in Leviticus 23. He should have added that. I think that is very insulting to him. Now, what about Purim? Should we celebrate Purim? Well, is it one of those listed in Leviticus 23? Always go back to God's word. Don't be like Constantine. He didn't even know what was in God's word. Read the word of God. Is Purim, did God ask us to celebrate? No. And just like Hanukkah, Purim is a man-made Jewish feast. Let's read about it in Esther chapter 9, 20 to 22. It says, Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, urging them to celebrate the 14th and 15th days of Adar every year as the days when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into celebration. These were to be days of feasting, celebration, and sending presents of food to one another and giving gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the commemoration they had begun and do what Mordecai had written to them. You see, the Jews agreed to do what Mordecai recommended, to celebrate it every year. Does it, say, does it say that God asked them to celebrate this every year, to remember? No. It's a suggestion from Mordecai, which they adopted. It's a man-made Jewish feast. Okay? And it talks about these days are to be celebration, sending presents, the food. Does it talk about getting dressed up like Halloween? Oh, but in Israel today, that's what Purim is. 
They don't celebrate Halloween like we do in North America. They do it on through again. Everyone gets dressed up. You see pictures here of Purim in Israel. Everyone gets dressed up like Halloween. Even children. It's a big celebration for them. It's their Halloween, right? But it's not one of God's holy days. It's a man-made Jewish feast again, okay? Now, you might say, look, is it wrong to add a feast to celebrate God? If we're really celebrating God, does it matter we can add a feast for anything, right? Well, Deuteronomy 4, verse 2, do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. See that you do all I command you and do not add or take away from it. You know, by adding to God's word, again, you're telling him that his Torah is not perfect. He made a mistake. He should, he should have included these two feasts. And that you know better than he does, right? Because you say, oh, no, I sh it should be in there, so I'm going to celebrate them anyways. You're telling him you know better than he does what needs to be celebrated and what doesn't. Now, I know that many of us have grown with fond memories of Christmas and Easter. We love getting together. You know, when you were a child, you wake up in the morning all excited, couldn't wait to run downstairs and open the gifts uh, with the family. And then all the family would come over, you'd have a big meal. And, you know, we grow up like that. And it becomes a, a family tradition. And Christmas and Easter are very strong family traditions that people hold on to dearly. And they don't want to upset loved ones by breaking with tradition. But what does Yeshua say about those that call themselves children of God, but they hold on to these man-made traditions instead of keeping God's commandments? Well, this is what he says. Yeshua said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Now, you know, when Yeshua said this to the Pharisees, he says, you have let go of the commands of God. He didn't mean they weren't keeping the commands of God. They were very strict about keeping the Torah. What he, the point he was making here is that they were elevating these man-made rules, these human traditions to the same level as God's Torah. They were elevating it's as if they were elevating Purim and Hanukkah and saying, oh, these need to be kept uh, equally as God's other holy feasts. And that is why Yeshua was so upset with them. And he called them hypocrites. Now, will God call you a hypocrite for keeping your Christmas, your Easter traditions? Think about that. You know, we are in the end times. And God is seeking true worshipers to worship him. In John 4, 23, 24, we read, At a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. God does not just want worshipers 
that are full of the spirit. He wants them to walk in the truth. Christmas and Easter are not holy days. That's a lie. They are pagan feasts. When we try to celebrate them as holy days, we are not walking in truth. And what is truth? Your law, your Torah is truth. Leviticus 23 is truth. God's word is truth, and you will find no mention of Christmas or Easter in God's word. But you will find in his word how he hates sun god and fertility goddess worship. That's the truth. Same with Hanukkah and Purim. They are not pagan feasts, but they are not in God's holy days. So please do not treat them as holy days. In conclusion, Christmas and Easter are not from God, but from pagan feasts. We are not to adopt, adopt pagan traditions into our worship of God. He's a jealous God. And God already established feast, the feast that we are to keep. There's nothing to add. Hanukkah and Purim are not holy days. And God wants us to keep his commandments, not traditions of men. And you know what? It does not matter what it means to you. What really counts is what it means to him. We must worship God in spirit, but also in truth. Amen.